Okay, so the point of today's uh, talk is really if you're hearing of the topic of classes or object-oriented programming and what is the relationship between classes and objects, uh, you're hearing this for the first time. Um, so this is just kind of a high-level overview. Um, okay, so for example, uh, a programming language, this is one example, this is Java. They have what they call primitive types. That's types of storage that you can declare, you can reserve storage, and based on the names that they give you, you can reserve the storage. So you can reserve a byte, you could, which is one byte. You could reserve a short, which is two bytes. You could reserve an integer, which is four bytes. You could reserve a long, which is eight bytes. You could reserve a floating point number, which is like integers but have fractional parts. Those are four bytes, and if you need a really big floating point number, you could do a double, which is eight bytes. You could also reserve characters and Boolean values. These are types of storage that you can ask for by name, and they're predefined for you. You just say, I need a character, and it'll give you a character, and it'll be two bytes. It'll reserve two bytes for you. <coughs> okay, so non-primitive types, things that you, the programmer, have to put some input into and to define it, would be things we've talked about in the past are arrays, <coughs> a string, which is really a collection of characters, and then plus user-defined structures and what we're really talking about today, which is classes. So non-primitive means Primitive means the programming language defines it for you. Non-primitive means you have to help out in telling the programming language how to define it. <coughs> so user -defined, a user-defined structure. Now we're going to take a little time. We're going to go like back into the, back to the future. We're going to go back in time to the C programming language. <coughs> now suppose, for example, you have an application and you want to define a person. So what is a person? Now, if you went, up, if you went on Facebook and, and, and tried to create an account, it's going to ask you questions like, what's your first name, what's your last name, what's your email, <coughs> what's your password, what's your, uh, what else do they ask for, what's your gender, date of birth. They have a definition for what a person is. If you went on LinkedIn, they have a different definition for what a person is. A person is someone, you know, where, where do you work? How many years were you working there? Can I have a copy of your resume? <clears throat> so how they define a person is different from application. <clears throat> so now the question is, should the programming language, if you're writing code in Python, should Python have a pre-canned definition of a person? Or should Python allow you to define a person however you want? Depends on your application. Okay, <clears throat> so a user-defined structure is basically allows you the opportunity to come out and say, I'm going to define a person. Now the programming language C, which came out in 1972, if you wanted to create a structure and define it yourself, you would go like this. You would say struct. This is a very annoying aspect of the C programming language. <coughs> struct is short for the word structure. If you actually typed up the word structure, you'd get a compiler error because it doesn't know what a structure is. But if you say struct, which is short for structure, it'll accept it. So anyway, if you want to create a structure, you would say struct, give it a name, and then open paren, close paren, you would define it however you want it. <coughs> so you can decide I want to make a character called a character array of 20 letters called first name. So every per my definition of a person, they have to have a, a, a uh, first name with a maximum of 20 characters. That's my definition. Okay. <coughs> a person can have a last name, also 20 characters, and the person can have a uh, date of birth year, what year they were born. And those are the only three attributes I've decided to have about a person. This is a silly definition of a person, but it just it's enough to make a point. Okay, now, <coughs> suppose 
I wanted to make another structure for a baseball player. A baseball player. Well, if I already have a definition of a person, and every baseball player is a person, then all I have to do <coughs> is take the definition of the person and then add new stuff that's only related to baseball players. So what I can do is I can say structure baseball player, open brackets, take everything from a person. So I can now say, this would be in the C programming language, I could say structure, the type is person, which is defined here. And I call it info. So it's a chunk of data, a piece of data called info, <coughs> and it has the fields. Info has these three fields. Then in addition to that, a baseball player has things that a person doesn't have. For example, they have a team that they're on, and they have a batting average. So let's say this is my definition <coughs> of a baseball player. Okay, so let's see, what do we got? Uh, here a person is a classification. It's gonna be a huge word because we're gonna go to classes very shortly. A classification on how to capture data about a person. A baseball player is a classification of a special type of a person. A baseball player is a person who happens to also be a baseball player. <coughs> you cannot be a baseball player unless you're a person. There's no uh, door baseball players or anything like that. Okay. All right. So, <coughs> creating and initializing an instance of a variable. So suppose I wanted to say structure person, I'll call the person P1, I could say open paren. Now normally when you initialize, let's say an integer, like an integer like x, you could just say x equals 3 and you give it an initial value. <coughs> but now let's say I want to initialize the person, well it has three fields, a first name, a last name, and the year they were born. So what I could do is I could say person, give a variable name, P1, and its initial values will be Joe Smith. I put quotes around it because the character arrays. And 1990, which is an integer. <coughs> if I wanted to print out person's one's first name, I could say printf is a C programming language, formatting print. Okay, I would say the name, and then this is for formatting. P1 dot first name. So I'm saying the variable P1, which has three separate fields to it, I'm interested in one of these particular fields, the first name field. That's how I print it out. If I wanted to initialize a baseball player after it's already been defined, like we have on the previous slide, I could say structure baseball player, BBP1, baseball player one. <coughs> now the first field is the person field. It's these three fields, these three fields. So I have to give these three fields as an array to initialize the person part of the base of the baseball player structure. And then I have to give this extra step. Okay. <coughs> so I can say, I could create a variable called BB, BBP1. It's a person who's also a baseball player. And I can initialize it to Joe DiMaggio 1914. That's to fill out the person part of this uh, piece of storage. And then the team and the back average. <coughs> OK. So uh, modifying uh, structured data. OK. Suppose somebody, all right, all right, let me go back. Let me go back. So when the programming language C came out, and many other languages like it at that time. These were big chunks of data, programmer defined, user defined, because you know the user is going to define what a baseball player is. All of this data was open to the open to any part of your program, could read from it, write to it, <coughs> destroy its data, put invalid data into it. So between 1972, when C came out, and 1985, which is when C++, which is the object-oriented version of C, uh, C++ 
came out, <coughs> some issues during that time period came up, and they said, oh, we've got to fix these issues. And these are some of the issues that came up. What if somebody said the date of birth year was 3030? So there's some baseball player playing now, but the day they were born was 3030. That would obviously be invalid data. What if the baseball player's team was the Rams? So, uh, so for anyone, anyone not following American sports, the Rams are a football team, not a baseball team. So if you said, I have this baseball player, and you gave a non-baseball team name, it would be invalid data. So we don't want stuff like the invalid data being put into our storage. But unfortunately, in the C programming language, all storage is available to any part of the program that can be updated. OK. Uh, what if the baseball player's batting average was a negative number? So batting averages of all the times you come up to bat, what percentage of the time do you get on base? So batting average should always be between 0 and 1. Never get on base, your batting average is zero. If you always get on base, your batting average is one, meaning 100% of the time. And if you get on base half the time, your batting average is a half. So batting averages should always be between zero and one. Any other number would be invalid. So if somebody if we wanted to put it a negative batting average or a batting average like 11 every for every time you come up to bat, you get on base 11 times. Doesn't make any sense. Or Jello, Jello doesn't make any sense. So we don't want to put data in this notebook. What if somebody wanted the last name of a baseball player to be blank? You're not allowed to have a last name of blank. So that's no good. So there's lots of data that's no good. And unfortunately, in C programming language, you could put in valid data and it has to take it. So, uh, and what if some other program came along and, and, and got the beginning of an array, as we talked about arrays, and, and just went and wiped out all the data that was uh, reserved by this piece of storage called baseball player? So the solution to these issues is object-oriented programming. Okay. So suppose this is now I'm going to play around and do some pseudocode here to kind of develop the idea of object-oriented programming. So suppose we took a structure and we decided that some of the storage, maybe even all the storage, was going to be blocked, blocked from anywhere in the program modifying it. OK, so suppose you took a struct from the C programming language, and you made the following changes. You allowed the storage fields to be blocked, blocked from being set, modified, or read from, the outs from outside of the structure. And then you provided functions that can set the values, modify the values, read the values, take actions based on it. What would we have? Well, we might have something like this. We might say struct baseball player, the person field, but we're going to put blocked in front of it. The team name, we're going to put blocked in front of it. The uh, batting average, we're going to put blocked in front of it. And then we're going to have a bunch of functions that are unblocked. People from the outside can call these functions and the functions have the ability to update and read and write the storage, but you can't directly read and write. So for example, I'll show you one example. Suppose we had an unblocked function called set average. Suppose you wanted to set a player's uh, uh, batting average. OK, so you could give it a batting average, and then we can have code that validates that the data you're giving is actually valid. So it might say you're passing in a parameter of the average. So you say, oh, this, this player's batting average is 0 0.250. They get on base 25% of the time. So if it's between 0 and 1, then we will set the field. And if it's not, we won't set it. We'll assume you're trying to push in invalid data. We're not going to take it. Now, obviously, we would put a message to the, the, ver the data you gave is bad. Try again, something like that. But this is just enough to get the point that we can actually have the outside world as being blocked from writing directly to these fields, but you can call our, our uh, structure supplied function 
that will actually validate the values you give us, and then we'll decide if we're going to accept it or not. If we accept it, you can update it. Otherwise, uh, if we find your data is unacceptable, we won't take it. So this was a big improvement over C versus C plus. Uh, okay, so this, is, this would be a big improvement over C. Be a little annoying for the uh, programmer, because now you have to put this word block, 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 unblock, but you get the idea. This would be uh, a lot better. Okay. So, uh, structure with block data and unblock access to, uh, okay, so this is basically a repeat of the last slide. Um, okay, so now uh, we have this set average function, which is unblocked, so the outside world is allowed to call that. We could say, if we tried to say the variable baseball player one dot batting average and try to write directly to it, we're going to get an error. It's not allowed. And the reason why it's not allowed is because this field is blocked. So you can't, in your program, write directly to it. If you said baseball player one period set average, you're calling the set average function. This is unblocked. This is allowed. And if I gave a batting average of 325, which is Joe DiMaggio's lifetime batting average, if I gave a batting average of 325, it would set the batting average to 325 for player BBP1. If I said player BBP1's batting average is negative uh, 0 0.325, it won't get set. It'll be allowed. I'll be allowed to call the met method because it's unblocked, but it won't take the data because that method says this is invalidated, I'm not going to take it. So instead of just reading and writing directly to it, now we have to have whoever created the structure uh, has to tell us what's blocked and not blocked, and we only have access to the unblocked stuff. Okay. So, if we were to take the pseudocode that we've been looking at for a while, this is, I'm calling this pseudo C code. It's kind of like if you took the C programming language from 1972 and you improved it and you allowed blocking and unblocking of uh, data, what you now realize is the data is protected. It's encapsulated, it's protected. And what's Unique here is that there are functions, C++ calls them functions, and Java calls them method, but there are functions that are associated with the data. They're not just random functions like what's the area of a circle. These are functions that are tied directly to this structure. So if you want to read a value or set a value, you have to call the function that's tied to the structure and that function will do whatever task you need to be done. So this is basically C with an improvement on the protection of the data. And this is actually the way they decided to do it when C++ came out. So C++ is like a, an improved version of C. It's not called C++ because that sounds like a grade in, in a course that's not very good. So they put two pluses to make you, make you know what this is C with extra stuff in it. What they decided to do was, because we're doing this blocking and unblocking thing, it's not really a structure anymore. They're going to call it a class. A class is short for the word classification. So now what we're going to do is we're going to basically have a structure with blocked and unblocked uh, regions of the structure. We're going to call it a class, class baseball player, open paren. They decided not to use the word blocked and unblocked, which I think would have been better words. They decided to use private, meaning you can't access it from outside of the class, and public, meaning you can. So public's not bad. Private's a little, little bit. Uh, right. Anyway, so now we have private person info, private team, private batting average, and then we have a public method where you can set the average. So this is conceptually a okay, would be like taking C, the C programming language and putting an improvement on it. This is actually the way the creators of C++ decided uh, to do it. Okay, 
So now we have the uh, idea of what is the difference between a class and a uh, object. Okay. A person is a classification. Class for sure. A baseball player is a classification. If I say hey, that person over there, that's a baseball player. It's a classification. Joe DiMaggio is an instance of a person. Happens to be one of the person, um, an instantiation of a person. So Joe DiMaggio is an instance of a person, and of course so are you. Um, and he also happens to be an instance of a baseball player. A baseball player is a class, a description, has data fields, and functionality, which are methods or uh, functions. You're talking about C++ versus Java. So we would call an object the instantiation of a class. So in the world of object-oriented programming, Joe DiMaggio would be an object. In other words, an instance of a baseball player. Mickey Mantle is also an object, an instance of a, of a baseball player. OK. Then the idea comes along of um, when we have a situation where you have uh, a person, and then you have a particular type of a person, a baseball player. We have a situation where every baseball player is a person, but not every person is a baseball player. So baseball players are a subset of persons, a specialization of persons. Depends on how you want to look at it. So now the question is, if we were going to have a class called baseball player, should we Take, take the fields that describe a baseball player. Should we make a field, a chunk of storage that is of type person, and then add additional attributes about a baseball player? So in other words, should we, there's a very important distinction between composition versus inheritance. A very, very important part of the uh, object-oriented program. When I'm defining a baseball player, should I say, well, a baseball player consists of a chunk of storage of type person, and then in addition to that, add more stuff? Or should I spell out, should I say, instead of saying, I'm going to make a, per a piece of uh, storage called info, and I'm going to define it as a person, should I get rid of this and actually spell out what a person is? OK? So here, let's see. Here, the class baseball player is composed of a person plus additional information related to baseball players. If you had a baseball player object called BBP1, if you created an instance, an object of a baseball player, then to access the name, the first name, you'd have to say go to BBP1 dot, the chunk of storage called info, this piece of storage, and then inside of that, that has subfields called uh, first name. Why do we need info? Why do we need this? Because a baseball player is composed of a person object we call info plus other stuff. This is called, okay, so this is called composition. This is where you say a baseball player is composed of two things, a person plus extra information. Now is that really true? Is a baseball player made up of two parts, the person part plus extra parts, or is it just a person who happens to be a baseball player? So um, here is the composition part. We have a person and a chunk of data called info. The other thing I could do is I can say this. What if I got rid of this and just put in the three fields of a person, which we said was first name, last name, and year of birth. What if I just put first name, last name, year of birth, and got rid of this? Don't make a piece of storage that has those fields. Just describe a baseball player as having those fields. Well, if this class, if this class person previously exists, and I don't think that a a baseball player is made up of two parts. Part one is a person and part two is the baseball player. If I think it's just one big baseball player, then what I can do is I can say, if this class exists, I can inherit from it. 
So what C++ decided to do was to say, um, we'll make a class called baseball player, and then we'll just say they had double colon. They would say publicly inherit from person. That means take every field that's in person, and I'll take a copy, thank you, a free copy, because I'm inheriting from it. And then I just add the team and the batting average, which is the only extra thing that's needed. So if I wanted to, using, using composition, if I made a baseball player is composed of a person plus extra fields. If I wanted to reference, if I wanted to set the first name to Joe, I'd have to say if the variable's name was BBP1, baseball player one, I'd have to go to the info field and then the info field has a subfield called <coughs> first name, I'd set the first name to Joe. But if I'm inheriting, meaning I'm just taking in the attributes. I'm not creating a chunk of storage and filling it in with data and then adding new storage. I'm actually just <coughs> taking that storage and putting it like imaginary, it's like right here. I can then take the variable baseball player one and go to the first name field and set it to Joe. Okay. <coughs> okay, now construction of an object. So when you create an integer, you could say integer x equals three. It creates an integer called x, and it initializes its value to 3. <coughs> right? So for example, you say init x, integer x, if you don't give it an initial value, your programming language has the freedom to decide what the initial value is. Some programming language will make it a value called undefined. Some will give it a default value of, let's say, 0. If you create a string, <coughs> but you do not give it an initial value, should the language set it to blank string or quote unquote, what should they set it to? What if somebody came along and said, I want to create a baseball player, BBP1, but they don't give any information. They don't say what the first name is, the last name is, the batting averages. They don't give you any information. What should happen? <coughs> so depending on your programming language, they may set up defaults for you. So in object-oriented programming, if we're now going to, instead of creating structures, we're going to create classes, um, we can have one of our methods, you know, we can have many, many methods within a class. The methods read and usually set and read the data in the, uh, the blocked or private data. And um, <coughs> they set those values. But, we could dedicate one of our functions in the class to run every time you create a new object. That gives you, the programmer, the creator of the class, the freedom to set your default data any way you want. <coughs> okay. So, suppose, for example, <coughs> we had a class called Fraction. And a fraction is made up of a numerator and a denominator, right? Two fields to a fraction. Now suppose you didn't have a function that runs the instant you create a brand new fraction. Okay, what, the, what your programming language might do is say, well, the numerator is an integer, <coughs> the denominator is an integer. Integers usually default to zero, so I'll make the numerator zero and the denominator zero. Usually people want to have a piece of storage and they don't know what to set it to. We start them off with a zero. Since you're going to be using this to perform mathematical operations, you may not want the denominator to be zero. <coughs> that would be a very dangerous default value. So you don't want to create a you don't want to create a fraction, like let's say you said fraction space f. Now you have this variable called f, and it's a fraction. You didn't give it an initial value. You're planning to give it a value later. <coughs> and possibly, possibly, someone may use it before you initialize it. So in the meantime, we'll give it a default value, but we don't want to give it a dangerous default value. So what we might want to do is have a function that will initially set the numerator to zero, but let's make the denominator one, just in case we do a zero by, divided by one, we don't get a math error. 
So the fraction's value will still default to zero, but it'll be zero divided by one. <coughs> so now came the interesting question. You created a class called fraction. <coughs> you want to dedicate one function that will always run the instant you create one of these, and the purpose is to just fill in default data. It does other things, but the main purpose is to fill in default data. What would you name this function? So a couple of choices might be uh, creation, uh, initializer. Uh, so what many programming languages, C++ was the first to do this. Many of them copied it, but Python doesn't do this. Many of them said, why don't we call, pick a function that's out of all the functions inside the class, if there's a function that has the same exact name as the class, that'll be the one that runs the first time an object is created, fills out the default data, and then it never runs again. So, you know, Python uses it, calls it a, a nib. Yeah, well, all right, so don't, this is a concept lecture. We're not talking about a particular programming language, but it's very common in many object-oriented programming languages to say that the function whose name identically matches the class that's the function that runs as soon as you create one. And it's usually used to fill in uh, default data. Okay. Okay, so now there's the concept of when you're defining a class, this is going to show up in every, uh, every programming language. There are variables like, okay, so for example, we have a baseball player. Baseball players inherit from a person. So every attribute that's in the person class, we get one copy. And then in addition to that, we have a team and a batting average. Well, now suppose we wanted to have another variable that counts up how many players do we have. So we're going we're gonna to keep creating new instances of players. We're going to create Joe DiMaggio, and then Mickey Mantle, and then Babe Ruth. We're going to create many, many players. And it would be nice if we had one field that every time we created a player, we added one to it so we know how many players we have in our entire system. So this would be a variable like number of players. Now the problem is, if Joe DiMaggio has a field called number of players, and it's set to one, and then we create Mickey Mantle, and he has a separate number of players, and we set that to one, and then we create Babe Ruth, and then we set his personal field to one, then all the players have their own private field called number of players. But we don't want that. We have the variable number of players is not related to each object. There should be one variable for the entire class. And then all of the objects in the class, all the individual players, share that variable. So when we create Joe DiMaggio and we say number of players equals one, well, number of players equals number of players plus one, right? Every time you create a new player, you add one to the player count. Then when we create Mickey Mantle, we add one to that. Now we have two players. And then we create Babe Ruth and we add one for that. Now we have three players. If we then went back to the Joe DiMaggio object and said, how many players are there? It should say three. It shouldn't say one, which is what it was when he was created. It should say three. So now we have an issue. How do we get a piece of storage, part of a class, that's actually not part of the objects, but there's only one copy for the entire class? We do that with class variables, a variable that is shared by the entire class. And object one, everyone has a different field. Joe DiMaggio has a different first name than Mickey Mantle, so he needs his own field. But Joe DiMaggio and Mickey Mantle both have the same field, number of players, and the values should match. So there's one variable for the whole class, and now the question is the creators of C++ had to put a word in front of a class variable you might think the best word to have put here was class, but they decided to use the word static. Static usually means doesn't change. But they chose static. So static means a class variable. Other programming languages mark it differently. So like I said, we're just talking about concepts for that. All right. So now the idea, we've talked about inheritance a little bit, but I just want to go over when, you know, this important concept of when to use inheritance versus composition. So suppose, for example, 
you may have heard, you know, people go to uh, take a course in mathematics, theoretical mathematics, and applied mathematics. So I actually have a bachelor's degree in applied mathematics. All right, so what is uh, mathematics? So here's an example of mathematics. One plus one equals two. That's mathematics, right? One banana plus one banana equals two bananas. That's applied mathematics. So we're taking the theoretical concept of one plus one equals two, and we're applying it to bananas. We're taking math and we're applying it to bananas. So that's applied math. Okay, so now, and, and you have to be careful how you take theoretical math and apply it to, um, apply it to fruit. So is one banana plus one apple, is that equal to two bananas? Do you just take one and one and always add it up and you get two? The answer to that question is no, because uh, the answer is no, because apples are not bananas. Suppose I said one piece of fruit plus one apple. Does that equal two pieces of fruit? And the answer to that question is yes. Why? Because apples are fruit. So if I have one piece of fruit, I don't know if it could be a banana or an orange or fruit. If I have one piece of fruit plus one apple, I do end up with two pieces of fruit. So the answer to that question is yes. Now, if I had another question, um, is one piece of fruit plus one apple, will that equal two apples? And the answer to that question is maybe. Because if the piece of fruit that I had originally was an apple, and then I had another apple, I have two apples. But if this piece of fruit was not an apple, let's say it was an, an orange, an orange plus an apple does not equal two orange. So the answer is maybe. The answer is maybe. Okay, so now the question is, is an apple, right, so, all right, so why, why are these answers not clear, and here's the reason why. Apples, oranges, bananas, they're all fruit. They're all types of fruit. So fr a fruit is an abstract, vague definition of apples and oranges and, and, and bananas. There are attributes that all fruit have in common, and then there are attributes that apples and oranges and bananas have that are independent of each other. So fruit is an abstract concept, and then apples, bananas, and oranges are more uh, concrete, not, not abstract. Okay, so now the question is, is an apple composed of fruit plus additional attributes? If you were gonna make an apple, would you take fruit and put that joint together with attributes only related to an apple? And the answer to that question is no, it's inherently, an apple is inherently fruit. By its nature, it is fruit. It's not part fruit and part apple. It, it, it inherits from, uh, it's, okay. So yeah, so it inherits by nature. It's not composed of uh, fruit, it inherits from it. So like an example, an automobile is actually composed of four tires. So if you're going to make a, a classification of an automobile and you already had a description of a tire, you'd have to dis define four tires. Tire one, tire two, tire three, tire four, and then start adding additional attributes. So a car is composed of four tires plus a bunch of other stuff. But an apple is not composed of a piece of fruit plus other stuff. It's inherently fruit. Okay, so object-oriented programming basically has four main pillars to it. Object-oriented programming is like C programming, which we started talking about earlier, except you can block fields, which they use the word private in C++ and, and Java. You can block fields. You can encapsulate your data and only allow certain ways to get in, providing publicly or unblocked methods to get into, uh, to get into the objects data. Abstraction is where you can define things like fruit versus an apple. Fruit is abstract, apple is concrete. A person could be considered abstract, and a baseball player is more concrete, a type of Polymorphism, which stands for many forms, the idea of, uh, of storage taking on many forms, you can we can create an array of fruit 
and then in that array put apples and bananas and oranges. So we can, instead of having an array of oranges, we can have an array of fruit and then have many different types of fruit. In it. That's essentially uh, uh, polymorphism in, in that we can have variables of different types and yet a piece of storage that can hold those two types. And then inheritance. And under inheritance, this really should be broken into inheritance and composition. Those are the two very important um, things that an object oriented programmer has to decide. But when does inheritance when does inheritance get used? Inheritance gets used when a classification like a person and a baseball player, if a baseball player is inherently a person, not composed of a person then we would want to inherit from it. And if a baseball player is composed of a person plus other attributes, different story than we would use composition. Okay, so, so like I said, this is a very high level introduction to uh, what classes are. Uh, once we pick a particular programming language to work with, you'll see how they do it, and how, what you're allowed to do, what you're not allowed to do, and um, 